Today, we're going to talk about a couple of things. Here we go. But uh, we'll finish up addressing some of the news about uh, avian influenza. Uh, that's been uh, more prominent in the media recently and why uh, we should keep our eyes out for that. So uh, first of all, just to give us an update on where we are with COVID in the U.S., these are hospitalization data uh, from the New York Times uh, website, which is uh, a, a good dashboard and gives you a good indication of trends over the last several weeks. And you can see we've come down significantly in terms of overall hospitalizations and hospitalizations in the 70 plus age demographic over the last several weeks, uh, really since uh, early in January, which is the good news. Um, and so uh, certainly a, a less prominent uh, winter wave, at least right now, than what, oops, sorry, uh, many of us uh, expected. Um, I, I guess the bad news is it looks as if that drop uh, has stopped and we're starting to turn around and, and at least uh, plateau, uh, if not turn back up slightly, as you can see. And, and we're plateauing at a hospitalization rate, both overall and, and in our more vulnerable elderly populations. That's well above the naders we saw in the summers of 2021 and 2022. And, and so uh, this reflects, uh, again, what right now appears to be the new normal of still uh, relatively high uh, in uh, COVID-19 uh, infection rates in the community and also hospitalizations. And uh, that's translating still into uh, a relatively uh, robust uh, rate of deaths. We're still around uh, between 400 and 500 uh, deaths per day. So over 2,000 deaths per week uh, still, which is again, uh, well above uh, 100,000 deaths uh, in a year barring any significant increases uh, over that time. So that's where we are with COVID, still um, certainly in the middle of a pandemic, uh, even though nobody wants to say that anymore. So here are data around excess mortality, and, and I've been emphasizing this, uh, I think, for a few months now. This really is going to be our best uh, window into what the effect of the pandemic is, because uh, certainly our case rate uh, capture is uh, lower than it, much, much lower than it should be. And, and even our hospitalization, and I think uh, COVID mortality capture is probably lower than it has been because uh, we're not testing as frequently. Uh, and the best assessment of the impact of the pandemic is probably going to be an excess mortality. Unfortunately, this is a very lagging indicator because it takes many months to actually uh, compile these data and, and uh, check it. But what you can see is over the course of the pandemic, again, uh, mostly in the U.S. have been riding well above uh, what our expected mortality rate is on a week-per-week -week basis. And um, obviously, there's been a number of folks that continue to harp on the fact that this must be from, or the myth that this must be from vaccines. And, and again, I, I think we've dispelled that a couple of times, but let's do it again. Um, so here are the curves for vaccination rates in the U.S., excess mortality in the U.S., and COVID hospitalizations. And you can see that, um, let's try, there we go. Uh, when we saw the first uh, winter wave of, uh, of COVID in the end of 2020, early 2021, uh, and a, a, a large increase in excess mortality across the U.S., that corresponds with a period of time when we were just starting to vaccinate folks. Uh, and so it's hard to explain that giant spike uh, in excess mortality that started well before we even began vaccinating folks uh, and peaked uh, well before we had uh, really vaccinated any significant proportion of the population. Uh, it's, it's hard to correlate that with vaccine, but it's very easy to correlate that with hospitalizations and COVID impact, as you can see there, that peak uh, very uh, closely coincides with peaks in, in COVID cases and hospitalizations, as you can see on the right. Then when we get to a period of time in the spring of 2021, spring into early summer, when we had very low excess mortality, and actually for a period of time, we're actually below expected 
deaths. This was at a period of time when we were vaccinating the most people in the United States. So obviously, if the vaccine were causing these excess deaths at a period of time and shortly thereafter, when we were vaccinating the most people in the U.S., we would have expected to see the most excess mortality. But no, we didn't. And that correlates with a period of time when our, again, our hospitalization rates were falling dramatically uh, from that winter wave. Uh, and again, there seems to be a, a strong correlation with cases and hospitalizations uh, and COVID deaths with excess mortality, but not with vaccine. Uh, again, we saw the Delta wave in the summer of 2021. That was uh, pre predominantly in um, <clears throat> younger people, right? Young to middle-aged people. Uh, and again, this is a period of time where we had relatively low rates of vaccination. Uh, but very high rates of hospitalization. Uh, so the correlation there clearly seems to be with COVID disease activity, not vaccine. The one period of time where we did have some overlap of uh, higher vaccine rates and higher mortality <clears throat> was in early 2022. That was the first Omicron wave. Uh, but again, this was the period of highest case counts and highest hospitalization rates uh, across the country. Uh, so that correlation still seems to be much more strongly aligned with COVID. Uh, COVID activity rather than vaccine. And again, uh, over the last nine, 10 months, since we've been seeing uh, a steady uh, rate of excess mortality above expected, uh, we see very low vaccination rates, but again, higher hospitalization rates uh, than uh, we had seen at, at previous Naders. And as we've talked about before, this rate appears to be of excess mortality. Uh, relatively speaking and proportionally speaking, is highest in younger age groups. So this is uh, analysis from uh, this uh, Twitter feed, Just Data, which is, uh, uh, she provides really good periodic epidemiological analyses of, of the pandemic. And you can see that uh, proportionally speaking, the, the highest increase in excess mortality has been in that age group of 30 through 39 for uh, the year 2022, tends to be higher in um, states that have had lower vaccination rates in that population demographic. So look at Florida, uh, for instance, uh, and um, lower in states that have higher rates of vaccination in that population. Look at Pennsylvania and New York, uh, and then obviously much lower uh, proportionally in older age groups who've had very high rates of fourth booster doses and bivalent booster dose. In fact, many of those age groups are now actually approaching back to expected mortality rates uh, over 2022. So uh, a trend that uh, I think we've highlighted a couple of times, but worth reiterating. So excess mortality and excess deaths across the last uh, several years have coincided with uh, COVID activity, not with vaccination. And uh, proportionally in 2022, excess deaths were most increased in, in younger age groups uh, between 18 and 49, particularly 30 to 39. Uh, and that coincides with lower vaccination rates uh, in those age groups. Uh, excess mortality much lower in older age groups where vaccination rates are quite high. So now I wanna move on to bird flu and talk about that for a, a couple of minutes because I think it's worth paying attention to. So folks may have seen in media reports recently a little more attention uh, devoted to uh, the large avian influenza outbreaks that have been going on really for the past year, uh, but uh, seem to be coming to a head uh, where there's been more activity over the last several months. You can see the British newspaper Guardian uh, talked about the, the grim uh, outlook in the UK for avian uh, flu outbreaks, and the New York Times talked about the potential for a new pandemic. And the reason this is concerning is we are seeing very large outbreaks of uh, H5N1 highly pathogenic avian influenza, or HPAI, uh, across the globe. Uh, here are the data for the US for uh, 2022 and 23. Uh, you can see that uh, over the last uh, uh, several months since uh, November, uh, there's been uh, you know very high rates of activity. Uh, and over the course of, uh, I believe, the last year, uh, 58 million birds in, in the U.S. have been uh, affected by avian influenza outbreaks and have been culled. Uh, that's involved uh, multiple uh, commercial and backyard flocks. And you can see uh, a significant number of states across the country uh, 
Not confined to the US, however, this is data from uh, the European CDC uh, discussing the fact that uh, in the last year, there was the highest uh, rate of uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza ever observed in Europe uh, with almost 50 million birds culled there uh, in Europe across 37 European countries. Uh, the Pan American Health Organization has also released a, a report about high rates of activity uh, across uh, Central and South America and, and North America. Uh, so it's a global problem and it's a big deal. And more recently, there have been a couple of concerning reports of, about um, more frequent spillovers into uh, mammalian populations, including uh, otters and foxes that were detected in the UK uh, and a large outbreak that occurred in mink. Uh, that included uh, very good evidence of animal-to-animal uh, -animal transmission uh, through minks. Uh, and the reason that this is potentially concerning is when uh, an avian influenza virus shows <clears throat> increased propensity to infect mammals and potentially to transmit from mammals to mammals, it indicates that that virus is starting to adapt uh, to the different receptors that mammals have in the respiratory tract uh, and that makes us concerned that it may be a virus that's becoming more fit to transmit in humans. Now, <clears throat> part of that may be we're, we're doing a lot more surveillance in mammals and, and we're detecting more than we would have in previous outbreaks potentially. But again, the fact that we're seeing uh, multiple mammalian species and potentially mammal to mammal transmission is concerning. So just a little bit of background about influenza viruses and, and what this means. So flu viruses are packaged uh, in envelopes that have these cell receptors and the main receptors are hemagglutinin and, and neuraminidase. Those are the H and N that, uh, that we see that make up the, the characterization of viruses. So again, uh, human circulating viruses are generally either H1N1 or H3N2. These avian influenza viruses are H5N1. And again, these uh, the nomenclature is not terribly original. It's just uh, the, the order in which these uh, proteins were discovered and characterized. Um, but the issue is those uh, outside um, proteins uh, that the human immune system recognizes and that the virus uses to attach to and enter cells uh, are dramatically different between those different numbers. Uh, and so uh, particularly immune response, while you may have decent recognition of uh, H3N2 viruses because they've been circulating now for decades in the US, um, people generally do not have good uh, immunity against H5 viruses because most humans have never seen an H5 uh, infection. Um, and so what we see is the, that hemagglutinin or the H, right, is the, the main receptor that attaches to the cell. Uh, and it recognizes sialic acid on the outside of the cells. And sialic acid comes in a number of different conformations. Uh, and the, the conformation that is alpha uh, two, three <clears throat> is one that is more common in birds. Uh, and the confirmation that has an alpha 2-6 linkage uh, is uh, one that is more commonly seen in humans. And we'll talk about that. And that uh, potentially uh, explains some of the tropism we see in the virus, uh, where some viruses are much more apt to infect uh, poultry and birds, and some viruses are much more apt to infect humans and mammals. The other thing that we worry about with uh, flu viruses is that the genome is segmented. There's eight different segments of the genome. So it's not one long single string of uh, genomic material or RNA. It's broken up into these segments, and these segments can swap especially when you have uh, cells that are infected with multiple viruses. And those swaps, oops, sorry, uh, can uh, result in what's called genetic shift, which can create uh, new reassortment viruses that, again, uh, combine things like high transmissibility with a high immune escape, because, again, you'll have a virus that humans have never seen before that's been responsible for uh, the major influenza pandemics that have occurred. Uh, over the last uh, 100 years uh, or more. And it was the uh, phenomenon that explained the emergence of H1N1 in 2009, <clears throat> where you had reassortment viruses from 1918 H1N1 uh, that had entered into pigs and swapped around uh, several of the gene segments. You can, you can see out popped the 2009 virus uh, on, on the right. Um, so a little more detail about the um, uh, 
receptor for uh, hemagglutinin and then the difference between human and avian conformation. And you can see there, there's this um, uh, alpha 2.6 uh, linkage between galactose uh, in humans and alpha 2.3. Now humans have both alpha 2.6 and alpha 2.3. Alpha 2.6 tends to be highly expressed in the upper respiratory tract. And there is some alpha 2.3 in the lower respiratory tract and the, the alveoli of the lungs. Uh, alpha-2,3 is in birds, and it's mostly uh, expressed in the gastrointestinal tract. And so it's actually uh, a, a gastrointestinal pathogen of birds, uh, and it's passed uh, probably from uh, fecal transmission in stool. Uh, but when it gets into people, particularly when it uh, becomes adept at uh, binding to alpha-2,6 in the upper respiratory tract, that's when it becomes uh, highly efficient uh, in passing from person to person by respiratory droplets and small respiratory droplets. And that's when human influenza viruses become uh, a concern. And if you look on the right, uh, here is kind of the, the progression or uh, potential progression that we worry about. You have a virus that has primarily tropism for alpha-2,3 uh, galactose linkage in birds, uh, but after multiple passages through birds and particularly oftentimes into pigs, uh, it can suddenly develop uh, the ability to bind more effectively to alpha-2,6. Uh, and then that's a virus that becomes much more adept to transmission in other mammals and in humans for person-to-person -person transmission. So that's the concern and why more H5 or other avian influenza outbreaks across the world uh, provide more opportunity for the virus to mutate uh, into something that can potentially uh, achieve sustained human-to-human -human transmission. Um, the, the scope and range of the outbreaks that we're seeing now are somewhat reminiscent of what we saw in the early 2000s. So avian influenza had been circulating in Asia uh, for almost 10 years at that point, but 2000 saw, 2005 saw a real explosion of avian influenza uh, across the globe, <clears throat> affecting flocks uh, outside of Asia across much of uh, Central Asia, into Europe and, and Africa, uh, and uh, this was one of the things, uh, one of the major things that prompted the U.S. Uh, uh, pandemic influenza uh, planning uh, cycle that began in 2005 and six, and, and resulted in many of the plans that were uh, created for uh, pandemics that um, since have been mostly gathering dust on the shelf, unfortunately, but uh, a, a major effort that, that had, uh, at least for 2009, uh, a positive impact. Um, and so the, the concern is, are we seeing a repeat of what happened in 2005 and six and seven? And again, uh, keep in mind what happened just a couple of years afterwards with the emergence of a new pandemic influenza virus. Uh, fortunately, what we have not seen so far in 2022 and early 23 is a significant amount of human disease detection of H5. This is in contrast to what we saw again in the early 2000s, where you can see, especially in Southeast Asia, we saw significant numbers of human cases. Um, arising out of uh, China and, and Vietnam primarily. Um, difficult to say how uh, transparent uh, the Chinese government is going to be in terms of uh, human avian influenza cases these days. Uh, one would hope that uh, Vietnam and other countries might be a little more forthcoming, although there's uh, also a lot of uh, political um, uh, undertones to reporting these types of cases and, and also a good bit of controversy about the fact that many of these countries provided uh, lots of data and even virus samples in the early 2000s to help develop vaccines against avian influenza and uh, received no benefit uh, from the companies that developed those vaccines. And so uh, it becomes a pretty complicated international political landscape as well. But, but I think bottom line is so far, right now we're not seeing a lot of human cases. And so that's at least a little bit of comfort, but again, doesn't take much. Uh, for a, a virus to get into uh, the right host and potentially pigs and, and to produce a virus that's more adept at transmitting uh, between people. So uh, good to keep our eye on what's happening in the avian influenza space over the next several months uh, and see this, how this progresses. But <clears throat> clearly what we don't want is another uh, respiratory virus pandemic uh, coming in, in the middle of what is still an ongoing coronavirus pandemic. Thanks, that's all I have.